Yes. Okay. All right, this is an interview at Days Inn, Hicksville, New York, with Joseph Kesselman, uh, 11-21-03, approximately 8.50 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Mr. Kesselman. Okay. Born 1916, graduated high school at um, about age 17. Uh, these were the depression times through my high school years. I sold newspapers every day of the week, seven days a week, for four years, because things were difficult at those times and it was necessary for all of us to work. I worked from the time of age 13 to 17, graduated Erasmus Hall High School at 17. I then took a um, job in a sweater factory as a apprentice mechanic on knitting machines. I worked on this job for quite a while, but after work every night I stayed and the men on the machines taught me the trade. When one of the men's left, one of the men left, I asked the boss to put me on as a mechanic, which he did. Uh, I progressed in that mechanic and that job as an apprentice and became a full mechanic. I married in 1940, had a child in 43. When the war came, I decided to enlist in the Army uh, Air Corps. I was rejected for a deviated septum and I went back to work and at that point I was taking the police examination tests. So I was studying every night and exercising and I passed the police academy test and was uh, <clears throat> told to report to duty as a policeman. At the same time I was asked to appear before the draft. I could have been deferred because police do not go into service. They stay and take care of the people at home. <clears throat> I went through the draft, left my wife and child, and went to Fort Dix for two weeks, then Fort McClellan, Alabama. And I stayed there for 17 weeks. While there, I found the training, which was very difficult, easy for me, because I had been training for two years prior to going into the Army as a policeman. Uh, I was uh, promoted to right guide, which gave me very special privileges, of course, a very special position. Uh, when they had a uh, sharpshooting contest for the entire camp at the end of our training period, I won first prize. My wife <coughs> came down to the ceremony to see that I got the awards for being a sharpshooter, the best in the camp at that time. I was well trained because it was more or less easier for me for my previous training, as I said. From there we, 17 weeks, one week home, and then goodbye, family and child, and over to England. We stayed about three months in England, training, maneuvering, and then we were put into a Delmere Forest area at the southern tip of England. We were then trained for D-Day. We went out into the waters and in training and then came back. We did that quite a while and then about 10 days before D-Day, 100 of us, 100 soldiers of the about 100,000 men that were in the camp to be sent in on D-Day as they were needed. Why this particular hundred men were picked from the thousands, I do not know. But one of my friends that was picked was John J. McCluskey, and we were together all through the war and after for many, for over 50 or 60 years. Uh, <clears throat> who we were and why we went, I do not know. At D-Day, we were in one of the finest English training camps, infantry training camps that they have. We were trained for intelligence and reconnaissance. They felt that they needed more reconnoitered troops, intelligent troops that knew how to identify German identification. We were kept as a very special unit. <clears throat> Ten days in the camp, D-Day started. We were in the camp watching the maneuvering in the planes and all the action that went on, but we did not go over then. 
After graduation, which was at the end of 30 days training, we were sent over to France. <clears throat> we were a special group and were kept together all during the war below Paris. We stayed together. At the time of the bulge, we were then loaded onto cars, um, I would say tens of thousands of men, but we were kept intact even though we went on, a on this train that went up towards the bulge. The train was just a cattle car, and here's a photo of the me and my buddies, one which is McCluskey, Helms, McCran, and myself. Now, which, are, which one is you, if you hold it? The one on the far left here is me. As you can see, there are no seats, no beds, no water, no toilets, no food, no nothing. The train stopped periodically okay. to help the men okay. uh, do what they had to do, and they gave us some food on the way. We arrived at St. Tron, which is in Belgium. And uh, that night we stepped, slept in a convent, and uh, in the evening we went up on top and watched the Battle of the Bulge going on in front of us. What an exciting experience to see that. <clears throat> the next day we were sent up to be in integrated into the 78th Infantry Division. We, as special trained intelligence reconnaissance soldiers, were to be put in regimental headquarters and higher. Ninety-nine of the men were assigned. I as one, for whatever reason, I, I don't know why I was selected, and I don't know why this happened. This is where it works. I was sent to K Company, 78th Infantry Division, 3rd Battalion, 309th Regiment. <clears throat> uh, we were sent up to the company Rear CP. Now that's uh, uh, the CP is the headquarters, only it's the rear and back of the actual fighting about 100 yards, that's all. And they had a bombed out cellar. I was sitting with another fellow that came up with me with the guide that took us into the position because the line was very fluid and we had to be taken to where the company was. While sitting there in this bombed out shelter, which was the basement of a remains of a building, a uh, German radio was speaking and said that we had advanced a certain period of uh, a certain amount of land. And I turned to the fellow next to me and said, well, I guess we did pretty good today. The captain swerved around and said, did you understand that? And I said, yes. I understood it because I'm Jewish and the German part that they said was easy to understand because it was numbers and names. So I understood it. He said, well, you stay with me, and he sent the other fellow up into a hole in the line. The line was, oh, maybe 100 yards forward or 200 yards forward from where we were exactly. Everybody else was in the holes, and we slept in this bummed-out shelter. <clears throat> I stayed with the captain about two or three days, and uh, then they, uh, when the night that I had to go on duty, they said, no, you stay. And I was sent out that night, they wrapped me up in white sheets that they had, and wrapped my gun up in white sheets. And I went over the lines with a half a dozen men, and all the apparatus, all the machine guns that we had were prepared for us to go over, capture a prisoner. I was told I have to capture a prisoner, bring him back with the six men that they sent along with me. We went over the line, and I was very fortunate when we got into no man's land, one German got out of his foxhole to go somewhere, and I was able to grab him and capture him and bring him over to the six men. We went back to the CP, to the rear CP with the captain, and he was very excited. And we, inter we interviewed this prisoner for quite a while and were very successful with it. A few days later, we went into our first attack. When we, I, would, I walked with the captain and I carried wire too, so we had to stay in communications. Well, this was a very, very difficult battle, and when we got there, they had lined up quite a few prisoners. The captain told me to strip search them and get them ready to be sent back as prisoners. 
uh, I did the best I could in the German that I knew. One of the prisoners noticed that he had to advise me on how to tell them what to do. With his advice and my ability to understand as much as I could, we were able to strip them, search them, and prepare them for captivity and move them back. The captain was very thrilled with this because it was my first taste into battle and it was very exciting. Uh, from then on in, I stayed with the captain. Wherever we went, I went with him. And then he used to send me out as a scout. And then my first integration of battle was as a scout. <clears throat> when we went along, can I stop? Sure, sure. Okay. Before we left to go into our first battle, we had to go out and pick up our own dead. Uh, the captain gave me 12 men, and they were young men. I was about 27, eight year, 27 or 28 years old, so he felt I could handle it better. We had to pick up all the frozen soldiers, bring them back to the trucks that were waiting so that they can get proper burial. And that night, we had gone back to the... Uh, 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 where, all the, where all the soldiers were assembled for the attack. We went out that night through the little uh, fluorescent lights that they had made between, the engineers had made between the lines, and that's when we went into our first battle. After a few battles, I had become uh, accustomed to doing what the captain felt I could do best, that was go out as a scout. That meant uh, they call them points out. The point, the point scouts go out uh, half a mile, quarter mile ahead of the advancing troops to see if there's any particular dangers or concentrations ahead. And they report back to the captain, then we can go forward. When I went forward in one attack, we were going through the woods. When we came out of the woods, we came to a very large clearing, very large clearing. But at the end of the clearing, there was a pillbox on, top of, on the top of a hillside. That pillbox commanded the whole area. And we had to form to make a frontal attack. Uh, at that moment, I had returned from a scouting mission to report to the captain that the pillbox was up there. And we were about a mile away. And I had a prisoner with me that I had captured on the way. This was, had become a routine thing for me to go out and get advanced, and I would pick up a lone soldier or something, and I would bring them back. When I had this particular soldier, he said that the men in the pillbox that we would be forced to attack were thinking of surrendering. To the captain and I, he said, well, why don't you go up and try and talk to them? We, the prisoner and I worked our way up this mile distance to the open fields when we went around the edges where we were a little protected. We got within shouting range of the pillbox, and we held, we hollered to them to come out in their language, which they did after some consultation. They opened the doors and came out. As they were coming out, the captain turned to run away. I shot at him. When I did that, they all ran back into the pillbox and opened up on the two of us with mortars, machine guns, and everything they had. They were very scared, very upset. After a while, it settled down. The only thing that I felt I could do was I gave the prisoner a white flag to take and carry with him as he ran towards the pillbox. He went in. After about 10 or 15 minutes, he came out. And with him came about 28 men. They stood in front of me, all disarrayed, and with their weapons, I commanded them in German to stand at attention and drop their weapons and take their helmets off. They stood together and I marched them down about a mile to where the men were, and they were our prisoners, and the pillbox was ours, without a loss of a man. The captain was very excited about this, that we could accomplish this without anybody getting killed in this particular battle. He, that was when he wrote me up for the first Bronze Star. I did not know that he did this. This was just in the day that happened, and it was a very exciting incident. Well, from then on in, we went from battle to battle. Can you cut? You walked deeper in and you were given life preservers. What's that? You walked deep into Germany and were given life preservers for the yeah, war. Yeah, yeah, so I'm going. Then we went into quite a few more battles. Each time, I was sent out as a point scout. I was extremely fortunate. 
I always came back. A lot of times when I didn't go out, others did. A lot of them didn't come back. So I was very, very, very fortunate. Well, we went out for a few more battles until we came to the River Rhine. At that time, when we had dug in, we were ordered to, we were issued life preservers that we were going over the Rhine the next night. Well, before that happened, there was a, an order came down that the Raymarkham Bridge had been taken and they needed infantry. So we started marching that day. We marched all day and all night, and we must have walked about 20, 30 miles at least, because we had gone steady for about 30 hours of marching until we came to the bridge. When we came to the bridge, we ran over, and most of the men with me, a lot of the men with me, got wounded fighting, running across the bridge. We got over, and we, and we began to get most of the 78th over which then gave us control of the bridge and the area behind it. When we went over the bridge, there was an indication of what was happening because, we again, in front of us we had the Autobahn and I saw a big tank up there. And I uh, went forward in my usual maneuvers of creeping and crawling around and got within shouting distance of the tank. When nobody answered, I ran up to the tank and saw that it had been abandoned, which meant that the Germans, I guess, were getting a little um, out of fuel and ammunition and were retreating a little further than we had hoped. We took this position. We were very happy to take that without a battle. As we went along further with many more battles, again, we came to a very large open field, of course these were the areas that were well and easily defended. And down about a mile away there was a hilltop and I could see a lot of men on top of the hill. I reported this to the captain and he said, do you think that uh, you could talk these people into surrendering? I said, I don't know, but I'll go up there and find out. So I crept around and rolled and got to near the bottom of the hill and walked up to the near the top of the hill. When I got there, I found a German machine gun on the ground. I picked it up and for the, just for curiosity, I fired, fired this weapon all over and put it down. When I put it down, I looked up and there were 40 men standing there with their hands in the air. I guess they wanted to surrender. Little did I know, but I found out later by, I saw a movie about how a small group of men wanted to surrender to another small group and it was unsuccessful because a small group will fight with a small group, but a small group who want to surrender will not fight one man. They know that they have the control over him. Forty men against myself with only a rifle, they had control, so they could talk to me, and they did. And they wanted to surrender. I again, I went through the routine of, you know, still gestanden means stand at attention and take your hats off and put your guns down. They all got weapons on them. They're standing with their weapons in front of me. They just didn't want to fight. So I was secure in the knowledge that they wanted to surrender. Again, I marched these 40 men down into the where our 200 men was, were stationed and waiting to attack. And again, we took the position without a loss of life, and we were able to continue forward into battle. Cut, cut, cut. We then continued advancing, and somewhere along the line, I got, I got wounded, but I kept, uh, it, it, it didn't stop me from continuing with the men. You get to have a feeling this is your friends, your buddies, and you want to stay with them as much as you can. We then took a town by the name of Hennef, it was on the Hennef River, and we were able to dig in on one side, and the Germans were on the other side, which gave both sides a chance to regroup and settle down. A lot of the men were going to services, it was on a Sunday, and they were going back into the woods, further back into the woods and had services. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed that we didn't have Jewish services. I asked through channels if I could go to the major, and I did, they gave me permission. I went to the major. And I told him I would like to have Jewish services. He says, what does he have to do to help me? He says, just give me a couple of jeeps and a couple of drivers and we'll ride, I'll go through the whole battalion and I'll round up as many boys as I can. Which I did and I rounded up about oh, 30 or 40 fellows and we went back into the woods. We had services. This was an important point because there I met a friend of mine who was, I played 
within the streets and back home when we were young. And we had a great time together and all of us had a great time. The idea of just having a service among ourselves was a very good thought. He went back, he was in battalion headquarters and he asked me what I was doing. Now he said he heard about it and he went back and I went back to my outfit. But that wasn't the end of it. More, more came of that. Um, we then went back into battles. Um, Epinic. Epinic. Yes. And we came to a very difficult, big battle. I think one of the most difficult we had of all the battles. We had the first 101st Airborne on our right, we had the 9th Armored on our left, and we had to go down the middle. And together we were going forward into Germany. <clears throat> they, they had a battle called the Battle of Epinick, which is a small little town, but it wasn't a town that was needed. It was ne the land in front of the town. And we were back, and the other two sides had advanced further than us, and we had to go forward. And we went through, we came out of the woods again. We go usually through the woods, and then we came out, and again, this big open field. It was farmland, and down about two miles down at the end of the farmland was this little town called Epinick, a very small town. We started to advance, and we found that the Germans had dug in along the crest of the hill way before the town, and we could not go, so we called for tanks. When the tanks came up, they started to advance, and they were knocked out. Three of the five were knocked out right away and they came back. Now how it happened I don't know, but myself and two other men were well in front of the other soldiers that were waiting to go into battle to, to try to get through to Epinick. It was a very difficult situation as the tanks couldn't go. And one of the, one of the three of us, his name was Bernard Shea. And I had slept with him in the same hole the night before and he and another fellow and I, and I had the radio, were dug in in front of everybody. Again, I say, I don't know how we got there or why. I always seemed to be in front of everything and usually alone. He picked his head up to tell me that, it was a, that there was a, a, a sniper roof on our left and we should stay down. When he picked his head up to show me, he got a bullet through the head, he died. Now we had to get out. The captain was screaming that I should bring the radio back and I had to somehow take the other fellow because he got all upset and I, he was out of control and I pulled him and the radio back to where the captain was. Fortunately, we were able to get there. When I got there, the captain called battalion and told him it was a very difficult situation, that the tanks were knocked out, they couldn't go forward, and the, the position was very well fortified, the whole hill. They were dug in in a trench. He said, well, we have to go because otherwise it would upset the battle plan because the 101st and the 9th Armored were advancing. We had to stay with them. So we just formed a line of march and fire, and we got up, and we went, started, we ran the two miles and half got to the town of Epinick. We captured the town. We lost half of the men. The captain was very distraught about this. After all, Bernard Shea was one of the group that started the whole battle scene with us, and he was very distraught. He had, uh, in a short time, he had to leave. Cut. Right after that, I was given a pass to Paris. This was given every two weeks to any of the remaining soldiers that were still around. And I was one of the few that still was there from the beginning. And I got two weeks in Paris, and I met the captain on the way to Paris. I said, yeah, you just stop at the kitchen area. They give you new clothes and stuff and food. And the captain saw that they gave me a duffel bag full of very valuable things, such as soap and, and coffee and uh, chocolates. So when I went to Paris, I would have, he asked me if I had money. I didn't, naturally. And he says, you take this, it'll help you in Paris. He, he continued on the way home and I went to Paris. That was the last I saw of my buddy, the captain, Captain Woodman, wonderful man. He shared all, everything that I captured and had, he shared with me. We were more friends than we were soldier and captain. Um, while I was
was in Paris when I came back, we now had a new captain. Again, I did, I re, they told him what I do, the first sergeant, Sergeant Verhovic, who was as close to me as the captain was, uh, told him what I do and I went out on my scouting missions again and we were in the woods and I was about a mile ahead walking through the woods when I came and looked out in front of me quite a distance down I saw a big, very big tank with German infantry around it advancing towards us. I ran all the way back to the captain and told him what was happening and he deployed our soldiers, he put our bazooka teams out and we were in a position to be able to fight with them. When they approached we drove them back. We held our position. We were saved, we, I saved a lot of lives there because we weren't suddenly attacked. This was a very important thing. From here the battalion recruited me out of, out of company to into battalion headquarters as they had an S2 intelligence section that they had a new lieutenant for and they had heard about me and they took me from my company which I hated to leave but orders are orders, are orders and I had to go to battalion and take up my new duties. After a few days with the new position the lieutenants uh, wanted to go on a mission to reconnoiter there was a town that they had to attack and uh, he and I and two other men he asked me if I could drive I said yes I got in a jeep and well, I drove the jeep and we went through the woods to reconnoiter this town that we had to attack we knew it was fortified we just wanted to see around how seriously or how heavily it was it was fortified when we went through the woods which was didn't have roads just little paths I drove up, the, up towards a hill that would take us to the town and the jeep was skidding and it was muddy and I couldn't get the jeep to go up this hill. Finally I had to turn, turn it around somehow and get back to battalion headquarters. When we got back there the captain saw his regular driver which was the, my friend that I had met when I had the services. He called Sam Crame over and he said I should get out of the Jeep because I don't know how to drive and he took his driver and the other two men and they went forward to where we came from. When they got to the hill they drove up to the top of the hill and they were ambushed right then and there. I wasn't in the Jeep. My friend was in my seat and he was killed immediately. The others were wounded. Somehow they made their way back to battalion headquarters and reported what happened. It was a very devastating thing to happen. The next day we went through the town and we picked up Sam Kramer's body. It was a terrible thing. I knew his wife and I knew his mother. When I came home they visited with me. I still go to his grave to see him. I know his wife and she still keeps in contact me, with me. This man sat where I was sitting and he took my position and how these things are arranged from up above I don't know. But I was here and he wasn't. Uh, again, I, these miracles that occur, how they occur, I have no control of. I don't, I don't know who does. But that was it. From then on in, we went on a little further into the attack and we came across a town by the name of Allendorf. Now, in this town, they had a big munitions factory that was underground and it had trees and a whole forest like built on top of it. Uh, in, a, in the bottom of this mine, actually a mine, it was a big factory that they had below the ground in Allendorf. And they had hundreds of Jewish girls from Romania and a surrounding area working in there. They were in very bad health conditions. We took all these girls out and we put them into the German houses and we had them set up, we had them receive medical aid and attention and food and behind us came military government and agencies that took care of displaced peoples. The war was winding down and they realized that they had to begin to take care of all the slave labor that was brought in and all the people that were put into uh, work camps and death camps. Now this was a work camp but they worked until they were practically 
uh, on the verge of death. And we fortunately came along at that time. We stayed there about two or three days, but then the agencies come over and the high house, which is a Jewish agency, takes care of the Jewish girls that take him out. And the military government comes in to set up government. Behind us, governments, government, military government was set up a strict control of all the soldiers and all the civilians. The American government was very concerned that everybody be treated in a humane fashion. This was a very important factor that if we we're fighting a war, we were still human beings and we had to act as such. Cut. We came across two towns that one was famous for cameras and one was famous for knife silverware and knives and all things like that. Naturally, they were making only army material. Now, there again, I'm all alone, but I'm walking with a medic. What I'm doing there, again, I don't know. But way ahead of the outfit, I'm scouting. And we come to Remscheid, and there is an entire city with white flags or so sheets hanging out all the windows. So there's nothing to do but to walk through the town. At the end of the town, I see an array of what it looked like the, the uh, headquarters of the whole German army. But it was only the police force, but they dressed very ornately. And uh, they were coming forth to surrender their and their weapons, which naturally I took, and I had a load of pistols and everything, and I took all this back to the fellows and divided it among them. And I wouldn't say I captured the town, but it was the only one, only American soldier in the town for a while till they all caught up. From there we went to Soldigen, which is a manufacturer of knives and everything of that sort, uh, bayonets. And again, we were all alone until the Fellas caught up, and there we had knives and all sorts of um, souvenirs that we could take home. But they were, uh, it was a, an empty factory and an empty town. The Germans were concerned or were told that we were going to do terrible things to them. Well, we did not do terrible things. This was the winding down of the war. And in the winding down of the war, the emphasis was on control of both sides, the freed Polish, Russian, French slaves were anxious to take revenge on the enemy. We had to control them more than the Germans at this point. The war ended and we had to see that they acted in a humane fashion. The agencies again came in from France, from Russia, from Poland and all the countries to take their civilians back. The big emphasis was military government to set up government and do an orderly, orderly return of all peoples to where they came from without any more battles, without any killing, without any uh, looting or anything of that nature. That had to be very strongly controlled and that was what we were doing for oh, about two or three months before we were sent home. I was sent home with the first cruise at uh, the first groups that were sent home because we were sent home by points. I had a child, I had the medals, I had the service and all of that. So McCluskey, who I still kept in touch with, and I were one of the fortunate ones to go home, the very first troops to arrive. Cut. When we returned home, it was a wonderful reception that we received. We were received with such love and understanding by all peoples. It wasn't like what happened to other soldiers in the other wars. Everybody was excited and so receptive. Wherever we went, we were offered free entree, free foods. I went with my wife to the finest restaurants. I paid my bills, but if there was a line, you know you didn't wait in line. If you were a wounded soldier, you walked right in. It, the reception was a wonderful thing to see. Um, with the experiences and the peoples that I met in the war and how to behave, I came home, I could not go back to work. I opened a little business of my own and worked very hard with my family. They helped me, they invested with me, and I built a successful business. I raised three children. I built a nice life for myself. I stayed in touch with my buddies, McCluskey and I, 
for 60 years. He came to all my events. I went to all his events. He lived in Philadelphia. And my family knew his and his family knew mine. Helms and McCran. We all stayed together. Of course, they have all since passed away. I'm the only one left. My memories are strong. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served my country. I feel I'm a better person. I'm a proud person. I believe we did the right thing. Everybody believes we did the right thing. It was a wonderful thing to participate in this, that I lived. It's a miracle. I thank the good Lord for the opportunity to be here and express my feelings for what has happened. This is a picture of my friend Sam Kramer, who I feel gave his life for me. How these things work and who writes the book, I don't know. But I thank the good Lord for giving me a life that I really enjoyed for the last 60 years. <clears throat> I love my country. I love my family. God bless America. Did you want it? Well, which is which is which in that photograph that you just held up? You, you can tell. The good-looking one. I, uh, I know that. <laughs> just you know, the heavy, the heavy set fella is Sam Cramer. Mm -hmm. The skinnier one is me. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you a few questions before we yeah, look just at that? One, just um, one. Did you have any specialized weapons that? Being a, a point man or a sharpshooter? Nope, I just had my Didn't rifle. Didn't have anything with a scope or anything? Nope, just to... never. I never used a scope. Huh, I could hit a target at 200 yards bullseye. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing, the Purple Heart, was it you mentioned alluded to just being slightly wounded at one I time? I was wounded. I can't picture which battle. I, mm -hmm. okay. I, I, in all the battles that we went through, yeah. okay. I can't picture it. Yeah. I can't picture it. Okay, um, now why, why don't you hold that photograph and tell us what that is. That's the Conspicuous Medal of Honor that Governor Cuomo sent and that scheme De Dean Skelos, our local uh, assemblyman, assemblyman, state assemblyman, who is giving, who receives it and then you go to his offices and they present it to you. Mm -hmm. That's Dean Skelos. Okay, why don't you show us your... Your medals. Oh, oh, you have any other photographs? No. The frame. I, let's see. I gave you. I gave you. My, yeah, she I gave you my. Yeah, she these did. These are the bums here. Right. Yeah. Four bums. These are the medals that I received. I hold them with much, much, much honor. I do really feel honored. And wherever I go, if I mention this, I've had tremendous help and reception from different areas that I needed help from. When recently, when I re, re, refinanced my mortgage, I had a little difficulty. Okay. I wrote okay. to the president of the bank and explained my position and I explained my history. They immediately okayed anything I asked for. It's still remembered. Sixty years later, if you mention it, people pay attention and give you the honor that you deserve for fighting for your country and the proudness that I possess with it. So you received the... Uh Bronze star with an oak leaf cluster. Yes, I did. Okay. I have a bronze star. I have, I have a bronze star and an oak leaf cluster. That little mark in mm -hmm. the middle of the bronze star indicates mm -hmm. two bronze stars. All right. Silver star. Okay. All right. It's well, thank you. Silver star in the, in the Yes, I noticed that. Okay. Thank you very much. Now that was.